Well, first off, thanks everybody for joining this afternoon. Uh, we're going to do a webinar presentation for SCADA optimization, uh, reliability, and real-time MQTT. Uh, after the webinar today, we'll throw this slide back up there. We're going to also offer a promotion um, on some of the stuff you're going to see as far as edge enablement on Zoom, Zoom link radios, as well as uh, the Autosol EACM software on IQ-enabled products. So we'll put this back up at the end, just to give you guys an idea that it will show up again. Just a quick agenda. Um, Cover IIoT and what it means for industry, free waves space in the IIoT market. Uh, David will introduce himself. Uh, we'll go over EACM and then he'll do a live actual demonstration and then we'll have a little Q&A at the end. Uh, my name is Nate Jones. I'm one of your account managers here at Freewave North America. Uh, the goal for this whole presentation is to essentially highlight how IoT is evolving industrial applications, how Freewave is responding to it, and how the right hardware and software uh, can maximize the benefits of the new Industry 4.0, as it's being called. Uh, as I said, joining me today is David Blanco with Autosol. He's going to go over their Edge software solution, EACM, which is currently available on all of our IQ-enabled products here at Freewave. And then he will also do the live demo, uh, and I'll let him introduce himself once we get down to that section. Uh, just to try and keep with the time, we'll go ahead and get started. So what makes an optimal IoT solution? Uh, primary components are wireless connectivity, reliable wireless connectivity, um, and, and wired connectivity to your end devices, wireless connectivity back to your network or cloud, uh, edge computing, power or hardware. Uh, for most of the industries that, that we all work in, you're going to want a ruggedized, you know, proven industrial rated edge computer. And then running on that, you need some form of automation communications software that will enable a lot of the IIoT benefits um, and enhancements such as MQTT. Those things combined lead to ultimately uh, optimization of your SCADA or remote monitoring application. So a lot of the words you'll hear multiple times is IoT and SCADA 4.0. So traditional SCADA presents several problems that have, you know, grown over the years. Uh, most of your SCADA systems are proprietary software solutions. Uh, most of the security is done either by isolating the networks from the World Wide Web or any outside networks. Um, data is typically pulled by one particular program, and that's what the data is pulled into and supposed to be used for. If you want to use that data across multiple different applications throughout the organization, it typically requires additional software or custom computer programming or manual transcribing of the data. And then because we're, we're talking to devices that are located in the field and they're instrumentation control devices, there's usually a little bit of a rift between corporate IT and operations level um, technologies. Typically, a lot of the corporate security policies and such don't apply to field level devices, and field level devices don't meet the requirements. Plus, with proprietary SCADA systems, since you're doing all of the communications management, protocol conversions, and, and you're pulling all the data from so many different types of devices, sometimes it involves opening several different ports and creating a lot of, of weaknesses through corporate security. SCADA 4.0, or you know, edge enablement, uh, changes several of these problems by giving you a little bit more of what they're calling an interoperable framework. So what that means is the data coming back, since most of it's being collected, protocols and communications are all being handled at the edge, so you no longer have to know how to talk to specific field equipment. It's all being done. The data coming back is more universal and generic, um, almost like text or raw data. So any program that has the ability to connect to the Internet to pull a piece of data can essentially have access to this data um, within your network. Security can be done via data encryption uh, before it's ever transmitted and leaves the field. So as long as your field devices are secure, the data coming back and forth can go straight into the internet through a cloud service and it's it's completely military grade encrypted so you know security concerns can be a lot less um, important 
or a lot less of a problem. Equal access for all users is kind of the same with the interoperable framework, so it allows you to use the same data across multiple parts of your organization, multiple departments, several different applications, as simple as an Excel spreadsheet that's connected to a, a, an internet-based database. And then because we're not doing any of the, or you're not having to do as much of the specific device communications at the enterprise level, uh, a lot of your corporate IT security policies can be kept in place and don't have to have nearly as many customized openings or, or, or allowances for customized software and customized protocols to be able to work. So it, it does cut down essentially on a lot of the complexity uh, necessary for deploying full-scale data solutions as we have them today. So in order to evolve or move into an IoT type architecture, um, certain things kind of have to take place, uh, bigger benefits as well as some of the key changes. Uh, obviously going from standard uh, device managed protocols to an IoT based type protocol such as MQTT, which you'll see more about with David's presentation shortly. Um, decoupling devices essentially means that now since we're talking to the devices, handling all the communications, at the edge, essentially in the field, your SCADA software or whatever software your users in your corporate office or whatnot are using does not have to have the ability to actually talk to those devices. So for your applications, it's essentially plug and play. Um, you, you are just looking at data. You don't, it doesn't matter what device it's coming from. And then the publish subscribe architecture allows you to get a lot more of your data faster to get the data that you need to see quicker. The data that isn't as important doesn't have to be asked for every time, so it cuts down on your bandwidth uh, and, and takes better advantage of your existing networks. Uh, all, all of this will be covered in much more depth with the EACM demo and, and presentation shortly. So who is FreeWave? You guys are, are several partners of ours. You, we've worked with you for a while, so just a little back end for those of you that may be newer to us. FreeWave's been around for 26 years plus years. Um, <clears throat> we've been manufacturing and deploying industrial grade communications focused low power reliable hardware during that time. As the technologies continue to evolve, um, FreeWave is evolving with it. So now that we're offering industrial grade edge computing solutions, edge enabled communication solutions, we do have radios that have edge enablement available on them such as our Zoom link as well as some edge-enabled industrial sensors to tie it all together. As you guys know, we operate across many different industries and environments, oil and gas, um, you know, hot environments, cold environments, smart ag, government and defense, as well as utilities and transportation. With the IQ platform, we're continuing to evolve what we can offer into new applications and new smart solutions uh, by working with integrators and software partners as well as end users and you guys as our resellers to try and find the need and fill the need. So what FreeWave brings to IoT? So FreeWave is integrating our extensive and proven industry experience with the latest advancements in IoT technologies. The goal is to create a fully capable and reliable edge solutions, but not only the hardware, but also continued emphasis on our first class support and service, uh, both in-house as well as with the partners that we choose to work with. So, you know, if, if it's FreeWave and has the FreeWave name on it, we plan to support it and service it the same way we've been known to up to this point. <clears throat> so when FreeWave decided to develop an edge platform, the focus was on a solution that not only met the hardware specification of the industries we serve, but also provided a solution that worked with existing installations and operations. This was the focus so that we could extend the life of those systems deployed today uh, and allow more of a managed upgrade over time, uh, minimizing the initial capital impact to try and take advantage of the new technology and benefits. So customers do not have to overhaul their entire system. Uh, we can actually expand and upgrade uh, parts to it instead of having to replace the whole thing. So just typical current SCADA architecture as it is today, just to give you guys an overall idea, 
a lot of your end devices, your your rod pump controllers, your RTUs, your you know any kind of monitoring edge device or instrumentation. Sorry, not edge device, but instrumentation. Typically, you know, wirelessly connects to a master station or cell modem, which then connects back to your backhaul SCADA platform, which is usually hosted at the corporate level on a server bank. And that SCADA has to know how to talk to all of these devices because at this point in time, nothing is done with with anything up to here. The SCADA has to do everything. So it has to translate the protocols, it has to organize the data, and it has to decide what the data is. And then it gives that data, makes that data available to the systems that are running that particular software. If you want to do anything additional with that, that data outside of whatever software provider you're using to collect it, you have to add more software. As you go into more of an edge-based solution or architecture, um, such as a cloud type thing as we're showing here, your edge radio, your data communications management, your device communications translations with proprietary protocols, as well as in, in an optimal situation, a lot of the processing and analyzing of the data now gets moved out closer to the end devices or at the end devices. And then that data is essentially published via MQTT, for instance, as just raw generic data with a label on it, such as well one tubing pressure. So when it gets to the cloud, that's all it is, is a, a value of well one tubing pressure. So anybody that wants the tubing pressure for well one, it's a spreadsheet or a software or whatever, just has to have the ability to ask for that data. Um, you don't have to know how to communicate to the rod pump controller. You don't have to know how to communicate to the RTU. All that is already done at the edge. So the software here can be much more of your enterprise-based type software for business side of uh, your Power BI's, your Excel's, your accounting softwares. And then since that data can go into a cloud type service that doesn't have to have the communications protocols, it's much more accessible, you know, at your corporate level, remote computers, or even you know, phone or tablet type applications that can access a website, um, cutting down on, you know, the inability to really use that data. So why are these solutions needed? Um, essentially, you know, as we move forward in the oil field, uh, it seems to be a, the theory of more data, more data, faster. So the poll response method of current SCADA systems, it has already been kind of tested. Um, as we move forward with people wanting to monitor more things and bring in more data points, that system is just not going to be a very efficient use of how to do that as you're trying to pull so many things when it's only maybe three out of the 50 that really matter or three out of the 50 that may have changed. So it enables data to be processed as close to the source. So if we're handling all the data communications, protocol management, and processing some of the data at the edge, then we don't need a, such a robust enterprise um, deployed system uh, because we're essentially just bringing the data into a database of sorts and then just pulling from there. Also, it allows you to upgrade entire fields of legacy devices. So instead of having to put brand new RTUs out there with the IQ, the Zoom IQ, or the Zoom Link edge enabled radio, you can actually bring the edge out to those older devices bring in all the data from them and then choose what data you want to see back on your server side or your, your end user side, um, the same as you would with a brand new edge device. And also it allows you to collect more data faster, which is the goal. Uh, high frequency data is, is a big push for anybody doing edge solutions and edge optimization right now. Um, creates data transparency. So, you know, you can access it anywhere, anytime. Cell phone apps, a lot of that run on these types of technology. Um, and it enables you to, to create new business models. So real-time operational data, you know, if you've got it and you have it more often and you can use it in more places, you can do predictive analytics, you can do preventative maintenance programs, and you can look at how to optimize your processes because you are now have the ability to look at a lot more data not just what's pre-configured in these device files or pre-configured with your current SCADA software. So in order to do this, you do need a, an edge software solution that can run out there and handle the protocol management and such. So that brings us to our EACM software. So I'll hand it over to David.
All right, thanks, Nate. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is David Blanco. I'm the Business Development Manager here at AutoSol. And today I'm going to talk about Edge ACM on the FreeWave IQ platform. But before I get into the weeds on that, I'm going to do a brief introduction to AutoSol for those of you who might not know us. AutoSol has 32 years in business with a headquarters in Houston, Texas. We also have an office in Calgary up in Alberta, Canada, and we primarily produce uh, SCADA software with our flagship product ACM or AutoSol Communication Manager. This is a server side or cloud side real time polling engine with multiple protocols as well as doing EFM and measurement collection for oil and gas. We also do integration services with a package called One SCADA that helps us manage and roll out large scale SCADA systems uh, rapidly and maintain them over time. So. EACM is basically a version of that ACM that we put onto the FreeWave IQ. Um, but before I get to the details on that, I want to do a little bit of context on how does EACM kind of fit into the shifting sands of the SCADA world, right? So here's your traditional SCADA system with an RTU, PLC out in the field, a communication path back to a server where you've got ACM doing the polling that feeds real-time data via OPC to an HMI and then measurement data to some kind of EFM platform, perhaps locale. So we see a big shift in this. And the big shift here that's relative to what we're talking about is traditionally the demand response is done on the server. That's to say an HMI has a list of 1,000 tags he wants data for from one end device. So he sends the list of 1,000 tags down. The device processes all 1,000 tags and sends all 1,000 back up. No matter whether or not those actual tags changed, just all 1,000 get sent up. Well, the shift here is instead of doing the demand response on the server, the demand response is being done on the edge. And what this necessitates is a change in protocol. So we're no longer talking the native protocol across the whole length of the network. It's not Rock or Modbus or Alan Bradley. It's the native protocol on the edge and then MQTT from the edge back up to the server. And there's a number of benefits to this, which I'll go over throughout this presentation and in the live demo portion. But uh, this MQTT protocol also requires some changes on the server or cloud. So you need something called an MQTT broker, which lets information from the field be pushed out to programs that are subscribing to it, like an HMI or a data warehouse, AI, or analytics program. So with that kind of context on how things are shifting in the skater world, enter EACM. Here's the 10,000 foot view of where we are. Uh, EACM resides on the FreeWave box in the Linux operating system, and from there, it converts the native RTU or PLC protocols into MQTT, feeds it back up to a broker where that data can be consumed from multiple clients simultaneously. One big advantage to uh, end users is that the SCADA HMI is no longer the only source of this field data for the whole company, so it kind of frees them up to be a more purely operation system while the business units can be fed the same data. Now, I want to focus a little more on what exactly is happening there on the whale site, because uh, that's where EACM resides on the FreeWave device. So I'm going to dive into that. So what exactly does EACM do out there? EACM, as I said, pulls the end device and converts it from the native protocol to MQTT. Now, EACM supports multiple protocols simultaneously and multiple devices simultaneously. And it might sound redundant, but I like to separate those out. So that way it's clear. If you're talking to a rock, you can talk to one, two, three, four, five rocks and a Modbus device, a total flow device. So it's not just a one track. Uh, EACM, when it's installed on the freeway, it comes with all the protocols that we have available. Well, the protocols we have available are these for real time. Basically, every form of Rock, Rock Plus, and Flow Boss that has been installed in a SCADA system, or sorry, out in the field uh, for the past 30 years. We also do Modbus, uh, ASCII, RTU, as well as include a number of built-in Modbus extensions to just reduce configuration settings, right? Uh, Autopilot, Enron, Daniels, Flow Automation, Omni, SCADA Pack, and Lufkin. We also do ABB Total Flow, as well as Allen Bradley Control Logic CIP. So since the demand response is now pushed out to the edge for this real-time data collection, uh, EACM is where you configure your connection to the device. So it's where you set, you know, 
your Modbus register set. It's where you set your unit and host uh, groups for the rocks um, and other configuration stuff that you do per protocol. It now happens on the ACM. You also configure your registers, tags, or TLPs on EACM as well. And we allow you to use dead bands or alarms on those tags to help you better control how that data is fed back up to your SCADA system. And we'll see a lot of detail on this during the demo portion. You can also configure EACM to publish to an MQT publisher. Sorry, you can also configure a publisher to send out the data to a broker of your choice. So this broker could be on your SCADA system, in the cloud. You can send up redundant brokers if you want to. And we'll see this during the demo portion. Now, the benefits that EACM actually delivers with that technology in mind are these right here. Um, primarily, EACM helps reduce bandwidth consumption. Then we can help deliver higher resolution data. We can act as a backfill for your data when you have COM failures, so that way your SCADA system doesn't actually miss any of the data, even if you had a COM outage. We can also optimize some processes to make sure that this technology can be used on serial devices. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of them, right? Still in the field, going nowhere. So we need to be sure we integrate with them. And also EACM can be used without overhauling or replacing your existing telemetry, as well as preserving your existing SCADA system or your client's SCADA system. So the details of that will present themselves throughout the presentation. But real quick, I've said MQTT a lot. Nate mentioned MQTT. What exactly is MQTT? So it stands for Message Queuing Telemetry Transport. It is a technology that was invented in 1999 by IBM, and it is a published subscribe protocol. So EACM in the field publishes data, or if you have hundreds of EACMs, hundreds of EACMs publish data to one broker, and then clients subscribe to that broker, and that's how they get the data sent to them, because they're subscribing to this broker that the data is sent to. MQTT is a TCP I-based protocol, and it is a report by exception protocol. So MQTT doesn't just send the data up, it only sends it up when it changes. And for that idea, I have a little uh, animation I made here. So here's EACM installed on a free wave radio out in the field talking to an RTU. And in this case, I'm going to pull that device with the traditional demand response every one second. Now, I'm not going to send that pressure up until that pressure changes value. Only after that pressure changes value do I actually send information from the field site over my telemetry to my SCADA system or my AI system, wherever this data is going. And this is where the reduction in bandwidth really comes in. So here's a comparison one of our clients did between Mobus and MQTT. He had a site that had 300 tags, and he monitored it over a 24-hour period using Modbus and MQTT. So Modbus consumed 8 megabytes of data doing the traditional demand response. You know, it's, uh, what's the status of this valve? Closed. Status of the valve? Closed. Status of the valve? Closed. Status of the valve? Open. But with MQTT, it only used 0.72 megabytes of data, or 90% reduction in bandwidth. Instead of a big fourth, it just says, oh, hey, valve open now. So you take away a lot of the noise on your network. Now, there's a layer to MQTT uh, called Spark Plug B. And what this does is now, instead of a change of value triggering an instant publish up to the SCADA system, you can control how often you publish data up. So in this example, I've got a one second poll rate on this RTU, and the values are changing, but they're only going to publish up once every eight seconds. So at eight seconds, I'm going to send all eight records up. One record, the latest value, will be my current value. And then there will be seven other records that are sent up as historic values. So basically, the point in the SCADA system gets one new value, and then seven points get backfilled into history. And depending on the HMI, you can run those historic points through as real-time values to still trigger alarms in the HMI. So what that does is the separation of the poll and publish rate I'm, I'm talking about here, what that does is it lets EACM act as a data concentrator on the free wave box. So now you can set up a one second resolution and a publish rate of every hour to send 3,600 records at once or a 15 second that publishes every 10 hours. And when we send this message for each register we're sending it for, we compress it 85%. So you can play with it on your network to see the best use of your bandwidth but what this 
data concentration lets us do as well is, since we're saving the data before we publish it, if we lose communications to the field, we can still control when we publish this data. So in this case, let's say we have EACM installed on a free wave deployed to a well site, and that well site loses connection to the server or the broker or server goes down. So that lost connection could take three or four hours to clear up. The broker or server cloud might take one or two minutes to come online, maybe. Well, during that downtime, EACM is just going to keep polling in the field like nothing went wrong. So it's going to store the data that it's getting instead of publish it because it has no connection and it can recognize this. And once that connection is, is restored or the broker comes back online, EACM just sends that data back up where, again, multiple clients can then consume this data simultaneously. Now here's a good metric to kind of understand how much you can store. On a free wave Zoom link or Zoom IQ, we've got four gigabytes of hard drive space and one gigabyte of RAM. So if you were polling 150 tags at one second resolution and you lost comms to the server, EACM will store those 150 tags with one second resolution for 23 and a half days. So the fewer tags, the lower resolution you have, the more storage you have essentially. Now some of the use cases of this technology are avoiding EPA fines at compressor stations. So in some states like Colorado or Pennsylvania, if your SCADA system is missing data, missing polling data from a pump or compressor station, they will fine you. So what EACM lets you do is you can poll that data, and if you lose comms from that site, once uh, the comms are restored, EACM will backfill all that real-time data into the SCADA system like it wasn't even missed. So here's a screenshot of one of our engineers installing a Zoom IQ radio behind a 900 megahertz MDS radio. So this uh, Zoom IQ, sorry, it's the uh, Zoom IQ box, not radio. So this Zoom IQ uh, box is running EACM, that is uh, pulling the compressor station, and basically when this site loses communication for whatever reason, and then they're restored, we backfill to their SCADA system. Now this doesn't just work, of course, for the you know big dumps of data from a compressor station. It also works for just normal wells that maybe you know, you got a 900 megahertz near a radio, maybe you got some piney forests in your area, somewhere with a lot of fog, a lot of traffic, maybe you've got a lot of radios coming into a weak cell modem backbone. All these situations can benefit from the store and forward capability of EACM to backfill this data. Here's what it looks like in an HMI. So this is a screenshot from Signet. On the bottom here, we see that uh, they had a comm outage and that data is just lost. But here they had the same outage, this is the same system, the same tag, but EACM was able to backfill that data, so once connection was restored, they were able to see. So if this ESD down here was triggered and then cleared itself, now they know to send someone out there, whereas with this situation, they've just completely missed it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are still hundreds of thousands of serial devices out there in the field, and uh, they're not going to go anywhere anytime soon because they're working. So this application called Priority Forward allows us to put EACM on a free wave in front of these serial devices, but not monopolize a device. So it works like this. EACM is on the free wave box at the well site, and it's talking through the Priority Forward application, which is built into the EACM architecture. I just separated it out here to kind of get the idea across. The so Priority Forward has two ports a secondary port and a priority port. EACM can be configured to talk through the secondary port, meaning that anybody who comes in and talks on the priority port will get priority over EACM. So for example, let's say my serial device there on the left is a rock. Well, if someone wants to come up here with the device configuration software like RockLink, as soon as that message to connect to the rock hits priority forward on the priority port, EACM is automatically shut off and that other software is given priority to the serial device. Then, once that other program releases their connection, there's a user configurable timeout period, I will use five seconds during the demo, before EACM can talk back. And it's not just certain configuration software, it is any software that wants to talk through will get the same treatment as uh, the first batch there. So EACM is compatible with the MQTT capabilities of Ignition and Signet. 
So Ignition is kind of at the forefront of the MQTT movement. They have a number of modules that let you use both standard MQTT as well as Spark Plug B out of the box with them. And I will include Ignition in the later portion of this demo. Uh, with Signet's latest release, oh, well, not latest, but the, the release of 9.2 and up, they are also MQTT Spark Plug B compatible with EACM. Now, there's a lot of other HMIs that are not MQTT compatible, like ClearSCADA, WonderWare, Telvent, VTSCADA. And for them, I have this little flow chart here on the bottom. Here we've got the RTU PLC, EACM, the radio network from FreeWave, a broker, and then an MQTT to OPC software. This software is a software by Autosol, which you'll see in the demo. And what he's doing is he's subscribing to this broker, and everything that's coming off the ACM gets converted here from, a, from MQTT to OPC, so OPC HMIs, like ClearSCADA, can then consume both MQTT and Spark Plug B data. And for these OPC DA HMIs, nothing really changes other than the source of the data. So you don't have to redo your HMI. You keep the points with their history and their screen links and their query references and their logic references. So this OPC point in this ClearSCADA system did not have to be changed at all to then uh, receive EACM data from the field. All that changed was I changed the source of the data from their previous OPC DA server to this MQTT to OPC DA server. And we'll see this in the demo as well. So EACM is also in the cloud. In our November release, we will have connections into Azure IoT Hub. And sometime in Q1 of next year, we hope to get a plug-in into AWS IoT. But to be honest, that's pending uh, client interest. Most of our clients are looking at Azure right now. So now I'm going to transition to the demo portion of this presentation, the part where you actually get to see something happen. But before I do that, let's take a gander at what I'm actually going to be demoing. So everything I have is going to be set up on my desk. And on my desk, I've got a ZoomIQ running EACM that has a Raspberry Pi plugged in behind it running a Modbus simulator. So I'm pulling that guy in Modbus, converting it to MQTT, sending it to my server, which is my laptop, where I'm running this MQTT broker. The broker I'm running is right here. It's Mosquito. Mosquito is handled by the Clips Foundation, which I believe is handled by IBM, who invented MQTT. So um, pretty good, pretty good broker. And then I've got two things set up. I've got my MQTT to OPC software subscribed to my broker, so my local machine, and then the, IP, and then the port of the broker. And he is feeding OPC DA data to a clear state at HMI, which does not have a built-in MQTT capability. And then I've got raw MQTT data coming into ignition. So without further ado, let's take a look at what is on the freeway box. So this is the IP address of my freeway box, 57.151. And this is the normal freeway firmware, right? EACM just exists on this box on port 8080. And this is what you see when you first come on. I see clearly that my freeway has synced up to its uh, NTP, so I've got good time on there. I see which, which apps I have installed, Priority Forward and Edge ACM. Let's take a gander into Edge ACM here. Uh, Pretty clean, pretty simple interface. Now, I'm not going to make you watch me make devices here, but I have a way of importing configuration between boxes. So I already have a templatized version made for this demo uh, called the EACM template.json. So I will upload him and import him. Yes, please. And I'll hit play. And we're polling. We're, we're, we're working. So I'll prove it. Let's take a look at our logs, and we can see the raw hex values coming through on my Raspberry Pi device. So all these logs are in UTC time. So there's 2134. We're still in minute 34. Uh, and the last gap was 1803. So this is pretty fresh. I'll hit F5, and we'll see that this area has grown. So I am pulling data from this Modbus device. I can't read hex, but I'm going to make the assumption now that this is good data also because I've done this before. So let's go back to Edge ACM and kind of look at this object-oriented tree here. So this is the device I'll focus most of my attention on for this demo and, or sorry, webinar. And what it is is 
pretty much there's three components to get something talking. There's the connection object. So pretty standard, right? Here's the IP address I want to pull from. Here's the port I want to pull from. And here is how often I am pulling that device. So for this webinar, I will pull something once every second. The other device is the protocol device. So this one is a Modbus. And just to kind of show you the difference here, so you see the TCP checked. I'm using the RTU register set. So I'm going to start polling from 40,001 to 40,006 as my core you know, webinar points. But there's other options built in as well. There's unique addressing types we, also, we have also included. But some other data types are, let's see here, the ROC. For those of you familiar with rocks, total flow. So you kind of get the idea. There's different objects for each protocol. And then here's where I also set my publish rate. So I will use MQTT Spark Plug B for this webinar. So I'm going to pull my Raspberry Pi every one second and publish data every one second. And here's where I say what registers to actually pull off that device. So there's a number of ways to set uh, these tags here. You notice that all these tags came in with my JSON file that I did to set this up. But I can also do you know, individual changes to them. I can make an individual tag as well to this group. But the way I prefer, and the people who have used this prefer, is it mass import export using a CSV. So here I can create a templatized version of what I want my tags to look like and then roll them out to multiple sites at once or make corrections to multiple sites if I want to. So I'm going to add, let's just say, 40,010. 40,010. So we'll save it. I'll make a little chaos here. Delete, 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 delete. There we go. Made a little chaos. So I'll come here. I'll go find that file. Lucky for me, it's on the top. I'll replace everything I have here from this CSV. And now we see I've got, you know, Mr. 40,009, as well as the one that I just added. You might also notice that there's a backfill column here. What this lets you do is you get to pick exactly what tags you want to backfill in case this box loses connection. So the largest number of points we have on one deployed EACM is 1,943. We tested at 25,000 tags with a five second resolution. But the user didn't really want all 1,943 of those tags to backfill if he lost comms. That's not 23 and a half days, I guarantee you that. So he wanted to, to be able to control exactly which tags he was actually able to backfill. So that's why you have this option here. So for this demo, I'm just doing one. So that's how you can configure a device to talk. And we saw it talking in the logs there. But for publishing, you need one of these objects. So this is where you pick if it's going to be standard MQTT or Spark Plug B. So for the sake of this webinar, I'm going to do Spark Plug B because I get to show off more of the features. Here's the group ID and node ID, which will come in handy later. So I'll, I, will, I will touch on them again. Now, for those of you that might want to use a broker that is uh, more sophisticated than the one I have, that requires a username, password, um, or is hosted in the cloud, this accepts domain names, uh, as well as passwords, of course. But I just have one, again, on my laptop, running right here on port 1883. Uh, you can also set up a secondary one or check this box and make them redundant as well. So let's actually see something change on the screen, huh? So I'm going to go ahead and open up Clear Scanner now where I've got data polling from my Raspberry Pi. So again, this is a OPC DA system that is receiving MQTT data. And for these dead bands, this guy's pretty simple, right? No dead bands, no alarms. Every time EACM polls and publishes, the value changes, so this guy changes. These two are on percentage-based bands. This is percentage of current value, not range of value. So as these numbers grow, the percentage that forces a publish change. And that's what the dead band does. It says, don't publish unless this condition's met. So these two down here are absolute value changes, right? Absolute value 5, he'll change at 25. Absolute value 15, this guy will change at 75. Or negative 75, you know, like if they go up or down. Uh, this guy's a little special. He has a lot. So he has the absolute dead band of 10. 
So the next time he'll update in the status system is when the value, you know, changes by 10. So there we go. But he also has two alarms. So when this value gets to 90 or higher or 10 or lower, he goes into alarm. And you'll notice he will no longer update by 10. Now he's updating by ones or by the lowest unit that shows up on my Monbus simulator. The reason for this is when a tag is in alarm, we turn off the dead band to make sure that we don't accidentally sit on an alarm value in the SCADA system just because it hasn't dead band yet. So this guy will be in alarm until his value is at 11. So the value on the box changed to 11, but this didn't update because the value 11 is above 10. So he's no longer in alarm. And 11 is only one more than 10, not 10 more than 10. So that's why it only changed when it went to 20. So to kind of bring that all to a point, the way the dead bands work is, you know, a percentage base, a current value, or an absolute value. But when a point is in alarm, we ignore the dead band. Now, I'm going to layer one more thing on top of that. I have two publish rates on this, on this device. The normal one, which I will now bump to 10 seconds, and these are all in milliseconds as well. Uh, because uh, I don't remember if I mentioned it or not, but EACM can pull up to 50 milliseconds of resolution. So it's in milliseconds to let our clients get, get that granular. So here I've got a publish rate of 10 seconds, but an altered publish rate of one second, which means that when something is in alarm, ignore this publish rate and start publishing every second. So when this guy comes back online, we'll see. So notice that the numbers are kind of stale now because we're only publishing once every 10 seconds. There we go. So when this point is back in alarm, two things are going to happen. We're going to start publishing again at one second, and this point's dead band is going to be ignored. So this kind of helps us get a snapshot of what's happening at that site, as well as getting us more data on the one tag that is, in fact, in alarm. So there we go. We see this guy's back up to one second. He, they're changing more frequently. And then once this guy's no longer in alarm, when he hits the value of basically 10 on the screen, everybody's going to shut up and go back to doing a 10 second publish rate. There we go. So I mentioned earlier that ClearSCADA is an OPC DA server. And this is a OPC point, right? This point that we're thing, oh, 4001, there we go, OPC. So if I click this ellipse, this is every single tag that is coming out of my EACM right now. And I can select any of these as OPC DA tags for this OPC DA server to do because I'm using this software to convert MQTT to OPC. So if you have a client or you yourself have an OPC DA HMI, don't let that deter you from taking advantage of the benefits of EACM in your field. You can still get all this data into your SCADA system without redoing it. All I did was change the source of my data to this to this server object, ASI MQTT compared to the standard options that are available, ASI OPC. Now the last thing I'm gonna show here is priority forward. So you may have noticed earlier that on my connection object for this guy, it's an internal IP address at 40,002. Well, I've got priority forward set up here for 40,002 as my secondary port on this box, 40,001 as my priority port. So if anything hits either one of these two ports on my freeway box, I talk to my Raspberry Pi. The so EACM is using this one. And then I've got this autosol communication manager here that will pull using the priority port. So if I go to the connection objects, we see he's targeting 57151, my box, on port 40001. So when I bring data through that priority port, it was value 1, 4, 8. So long as this guy's talking, EACM does not have priority. So I'm going to bring this up to 15. There we go. The value is 15. And now somewhere between uh, 20 and 26 of the value here, EACM will kick back on. There we go, close enough, 27. So basically uh, EACM is now given control over that port again. 
and then, and then another update. So that's how we handle communication out to serial devices. Now I'm going to show two more features real, real quick on EACM. I'm going to bump that poll rate back down to one second, though, because uh, I like data to change faster during these webinars. So let's take a look at a different HMI called Ignition. And uh, oh boy, come on, baby. Open that again. There we go. So here we have Ignition. And what we see here on the side, well, here, here's a device I, I have on, on EACM that's not enabled. This device here is pulling the internal Modbus registers of the freeway. I'll go ahead and turn him on. Reset. Wait for the connection to come back. And there we go. Now I'm connected to everything, and we see that the uptime is changing every second, right? This is, I believe, how many seconds my box has been on, 894,000. And you'll notice that these numbers here, 40,001 to 40,006, are the same numbers that I'm polling here. 94, 94, 95, 95. So all the alarms and dead bands apply the box level, so everything consuming this data is getting the same data. So here I am getting data with two different systems, right, simultaneously. So I like this chart because it, it's, it, it's pretty representative. Each one of these nodes is one value that we have inside of Ignition for this tag 40,001. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to unplug my box to demonstrate the backfill because we'll see the backfill happen in two places. One, it'll populate this screen, and then the second is on the database for ignition, we will see that it will insert, I don't know, roughly like 60 or 75, depends on how long I leave it unplugged, records. So I'm going to bring up this. I'm going to ping my box and unplug them. All right, I'm unplugged. Timed out. We'll see ignition go down. There we go. So while I am uh, building up a little bit of white space here, I will take this opportunity to once again mention that uh, we do have a promotion going on for those of you who have joined. And uh, that is that if you use this promotion code here on the bottom through your channel partner with FreeWave, uh, you get a uh, free IQ license activation on any Zoom product, as well as a free preloading of Autosol's EACM. And on our end, uh, once you get the box, just give us a call. We'll give you a free 60-day trial. We'll work with you to get something set up and test. We'll give you documentation. I'll even send you the uh, JSON file that I use for this demo if you want to pull the internal Modbus on the box. Um, give us a call. We're excited to work with you. So I feel like that plug built up a big enough gap. There we go. So I'm going to plug my box back in now. Oh, maybe I'll beat the ping. <clears throat> there we go. Plug back in. There we go. And all the data automatically backfilled back into my SCADA system once I received a good connection. And we'll go take a look at the database, I mean, uh, the logs. There we go. I inserted 64 historical tags, so I talked for about 65 seconds from when I unplugged it. Uh, you'll also notice here that there's a hierarchy of data Right. Um, here's the tag, and then it's under the Raspberry device folder, under the travel demo folder, under the EACM Spark Plug B folder. That lines up with what we saw here. So basically the hierarchy is this helps tell basically what overall group is all this data coming in. So this can be the same for every box you have in the field. This can be unique to your field deployment, the device name, followed by the alias itself. And this is just a good way, whoops, this is just a good way to see EACM Spark Plug B, travel demo, the device name, followed by the register itself. Just the hierarchy of data there. The last thing I'll show before we open it up to questions here is one thing we care about, as you may have noticed from the JSON file I uploaded in the beginning to the CSV I used, is manageability and scalability. So we have a mass manager app available here that, oh, I guess I'm, it's, it's already running. I'll go ahead and close it and reopen it. Uh, yes, please. So this app here runs in the background, and it hosts a web server that I can access by just opening up a browser and going to localhost 8080. And this is a remote manager system. 
So here I've kind of already got a board, and no one likes to see something that I made earlier. So I'll just go ahead and delete this guy. I want to make a brand new one. So I'll make a new device. I'll throw the IP address of my box there. We'll save the settings. And I will sync it with my board. And now I've got all of the same objects here that I had on this guy, right? So Raspberry Pi Modbus, Raspberry Pi device with 1,000 second publish rate, uh, Raspberry Pi Modbus, Raspberry Pi device. Let's bump his publish rate to 10,000 milliseconds from 10. Yes, please. I want to save that setting. Let's go take a look, change the object, go back, and now he's at 10,000. So all the configuration settings I have available via the website on the box, I also have available via this server cloud side remote manager. So I can even do something like shut down the service remotely. Go and take a look. He stopped. Oh. He's dead. And then start back up. I can also do remote licensing from here as well. So let's go take a gander real quick. There we go. Back up and running. So that's the mass manager, remote manager side of this as well for once you get several hundred of them. And this is just the configuration settings that's a much, it's a much lighter load to send these little changes out at a time as opposed to loading up a web, a website if you do have this on a site that uh, has very low bandwidth. So while we open up the floor to questions, I'm going to go ahead and pop this, this slide back up. So that way, for those of you that would like to get this uh, code down here on the bottom, you may. And let me see what the questions are real quick. Oh, there we go. All right, so there's no questions yet. So feel free to uh, pump some questions to me because I can just keep talking until the end of this presentation. I have a lot more to show you. Oh, I didn't turn it on. The Q&A is open, ladies and gentlemen, so feel free. So while we wait for uh, people to type out their questions, I will go ahead and show something else. Oh, here we go. Tim asks, can EACM publish to any MQTT broker? And the answer to that question is yes. MQTT brokers do not care about how the payload of the MQTT messages are structured. Um, and the broker level is handled at a higher level of MQTT protocol. So what we run into a lot of times with uh, just standard MQTT is there's no standard for how that payload looks. Everybody seems to have a different flavor of MQTT. But MQTT Spark Plug B does have a standard. So that's why we're able to work with Ignition as well as Signet at the same time because they both followed that standard. And I believe OSI Pi has a MQTT module that they, I know they beta tested in February. I think it's released now as well, but that also follows the same MQTT Spark Plug B standard. So we would be uh, usable with them out of the box as well. Thank you, Tim, for that question. As far as I know, I have no, oh, sorry, Tim, Tim asks again, do all MQTT brokers support Spark Plug B? I'm going to say no, because I can't be absolutely certain, but all the ones I have ever seen at a client site or that are being proof of concept by one of the big boys uh, is. So I've seen, oh, I've deployed a Mosquito, um, that uh, system that we saw a picture of Cody putting the IQ behind the MDS uh, radios. We put um, Mosquito on his network, and Mosquito is what is talking to this software to feed data into that client's clear data system. There's others like HiveNQ that's also MQTT compatible. So um, I think all the brokers that matter uh, do work with Spark Plug B. So again, Tim, thank you for the dialogue. Okay, well, while we wait for more questions to, to, to come in, I'm going to show uh, another little feature here. If I go back to Ignition, we see how there's a little a little tooth for each one of these uh, 
pieces of data that I'm bringing in, right? So if I can come to my box and I go to the Raspberry Pi, I'm going to knock this guy up to 20 seconds and apply the change. So what we'll see is that ignition is going to kind of plateau. Well, once it comes back on, it's going to kind of plateau for a while and then it's going to jump up. So what we're doing is we're sending that spark plug B package, which means that we're sending one current value and then a chunk of 19 historic values at a time. So in a couple seconds, we see this big plateau and then each each, each one of these little ridges is a value. And if I go to the, uh, oh, well, now we're in alarm, so we're going to get to the, the updates by second, right? But if I go to the uh, log here, we saw that I threw 16 historical records in there at a time. So that's kind of how the Spark Plug B pays out, right? The ACM kind of pulls, stores the data, pulls, stores the data, pulls, stores the data, and then sends everything up as one package that we do 85% compression on. Um, we're not getting too many questions, so I'm just going to tell you some more uh, some more stories here. Um, we have one client who is currently under NDA, but we're working on a white paper with them. And what that uh, sorry what their situation is is basically they they have a 20 second polls with with the traditional demand response model, uh, even though they uh, they are using a pretty a pretty new and modern HMI and, and polling system. And we were able to take their polling from 20 minutes and get them data at a two minute resolution using their existing telemetry. So they didn't replace any of their radios. They put the IQ, the free wave IQ behind their existing network with EACM and got um, what? 20 times the resolution on their data. So it looks like we've got another question here from Tim. Tim, I appreciate it. Uh, do most MQTT brokers have translation to OPC for third party HMI? There is not one that I know of that does. Um, the Mosquito Broker here is not translating anything. It is all MQTT. What is translating from MQTT to uh, OPC, sorry Enrique, is this MQTT to OPC app. So this guy is subscribed to my broker. He's taking all the data from the broker and publishing it as OPC DA as an OPC DA server for an OPC DA client to take advantage of. And another way to kind of view that is uh, for those of you all real quick, here's the promo code on the bottom. I'm about to change slides. And that is uh, here on my demo slide. That's what that MQTT to OPC is doing. Subscribing to the broker, outputting OPC DA. Where is my chat? There we go. All right, Nate, do you have any uh, parting comments that uh, you would like to to mention? No, I think it's pretty well covered. All right, well, uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and flash our uh, contact information here. If any of y'all would like more, more information, if y'all would like to act on the uh, promotion we have going on as well, FWASWEB102019, then please feel free to contact either one of us or just our companies directly. We'd be more than happy to set you up and start a conversation about how EACM on the IQ platform can benefit you and your clients. I uh, see something flashing. Let's laugh and check for questions. All right. Well, thank you all for your time today. I appreciate it and have a good day.